today, I think. So thanks for having me. I'm here to talk about uh, our great work, which we've given a name, Catalyst, but it, Catalyst sort of describes a lot of things. If you really want to know about it, you should find one of my colleagues who's a teacher from Canberra Goulburn, uh, who's here, and there's a number of them. So shout out to all my colleagues from Canberra Goulburn. Good to see you. Um, and ask them about their experience over the last two years um, in our system. So we're, uh, we're a system, just so that everyone knows where we're coming from, we're 56 Catholic schools. We're the only system of any size in Australia that operates across two jurisdictions. We have 29 Catholic schools in the ACT and 27 across southern and some of western New South Wales. So we're a large archdiocese stretching from... Uh, Lake Kajeligo, West Wyalong, down to Pambula and Beethaven with the ACT in the middle. So if, if you wonder about the diversity of our system, we've got just about every part of every type of country, every type of school um, in our, our system. So we're by no means a small metropolitan system. Uh, and where I really wanted to start was just to say congratulations for being here. Um, we're part of something that I believe, I'm confident, will change school education in Australia in time to come. And it'll be events like this that people look back to and say, this is where Australia's great educational performance started. So I'm really, really confident about that. Then, of course, just I've got to acknowledge that I'm here to talk about my experience. I'm sure there's amazing wisdom in the room that I would benefit and I from, and I look forward to getting a chance to talk either after this or uh, in days, months and years to come to learn. And it, this presentation happens with a standing invitation. Anyone who wants to come and visit our schools, discuss the science of learning, the science of reading, the new concept for me, the science of reading comprehension, knowledge-rich curriculum, all of these concepts would love to discuss them with you, love to talk about how we're bringing them to life in our classrooms. It's really hard work but we know it's exactly the right thing to do. Our students deserve no less. And so we're on a significant journey. Today, by the way, is not gonna be a story with a happy ending as such. We're, we're very happy in Canberra Goulburn, but we haven't reached the end. Um, we're very much taken the first steps as a system. There's a lot of achievements, a lot of great achievements in classrooms, in schools, uh, which I can talk about some of those. Uh, but I'll talk about the journey we've been through and. Uh, someone said to me today's uh, conference, so today as part of the conference was meant to be about the hopeful um, part and hopefully I'll inst instil some hope in, in the conversation. Uh, so I, I don't need to um, discuss that further. So you know where we come from and oh, by the way, it's worth saying, yeah, 22,000 students and we've got about 3,000 teaching staff, part-time, full-time across uh, the system. So I think we, uh, in terms of US school districts, would be well above 50% of them. So we've got enough scale to do some interesting things um, in teaching and learning, and hopefully you'll find this interesting. So I, I just wanted to share my own personal um, story in a way. I'm not a trained educator. My mum uh, was a teacher. I've been to school. That, of course, qualifies me not at all um, to tell teachers what to do. Uh, but um, I am passionate about learning, passionate about student learning, passionate about a system that can support every teacher, every student, every classroom, every school to be the best that we can be. So we're setting out on a journey as a system. We want to be the best education system in Australia, if not the world, and we're going to do it through the science of learning and a commitment to the science of reading, applying the best evidence to inform our practice. So I'm going to tell you about that in a minute. So where my journey though really started, I was about a, a year in to being Director of Catholic Education of this great system. Um, and I, sorry, so that's, that's the outline. So I'm gonna tell you about uh, what we have learned, what we're doing now and share some prospective progress. But where my journey started was here. Uh, this is Jedediah Jeffrey Fox. He was born just over five years ago um, and obviously my first son, first child, big event in my life. And I thought, gee, I wonder how he learns to read. Um, and I'd been a, quite a fan of Jennifer Buckingham, a number of others. And I thought I really ought to understand for myself how Jed is going to learn to read. 
And so this was day one. Uh, three little pigs. It was a bit of a spicy version, um, but a bit of fun. Uh, so obviously I, I committed as a system leader to say, I'm going to understand this. I'm really going to understand what it takes for a student to read. So that set me off on actually... I remember a drive from a place called Maruya on the coast up to West Wylong where I spent the whole time listening to um, Ollie Lovell's podcasts. Lorraine Hammond was one of them and I, I learned about her ideas of instructional coaching, her approach to teaching of early literacy, her experience herself as an educator. Uh, so have been through an incredible journey of reading everything I can, learning about the movements in the US, the UK, uh, the, re the reading league, um, the, that mantra of I know better when I, I do better when I know better. And so just it prompted all sorts of questions for me, very many questions. And then so in recent weeks, this is Georgina Mary. She's seven weeks old. So she's the new addition to the family. Um, she's sometimes awake, as you can see on the right. Um, and this is uh, her first book. Welcome to the World, which we were taking her through. Um, it was a generous gift from some of my principals. Um, uh, so she's really engaged, obviously, <laughs> uh, and starting her reading journey. Um, and she's a little bit sceptical of her parents at times. And then, of course, so just by the way, there's a, just to complete the picture before I get on to the, the main topic, there's Benjamin, um, highly engaged in his learning, <laughs> not quite... Uh, keeping the task. So we got the idea that if you get the foam letters, you can do all sorts of uh, phonemic awareness, promote phonics knowledge. He didn't quite buy into it, but he is making good progress. But, you know, I guess that's a good inquiry approach and been really, really difficult to see the results. But that's, that's Benjamin engaged in his learning. So we did, at, at the start of this process as a system, we went through a lot of reflection about where we could start, how we would articulate the challenge. And one of the things we came up with was this mantra, that it's, it's all well and good to say students are so important, we want them to learn. But in fact, at a system level, the thing that's most important is that the teacher knows what they need to know at the front of the classroom. They are well supported by the system with what they need to succeed. That schools are not islands trying to find out for themselves what the evidence is, how to apply it, and pulling off a heroic or saintly act um, every day. We thought we should have a system where everyone benefits from the system and that if we put a great teacher, well-prepared, well-supported, in front of every classroom, everything will look after itself. So we've made a commitment that the teacher is the most important learner in our system. And we're confident that if we're true to that, if we respect it, the teacher will deliver a great lesson, great learning um, in every one of our thousand classrooms across our diocese. Now, and following through on that has been incredibly challenging, mobilising resources. Uh, I'll tell you about our instructional coaching model, which uh, we've got Tony Hatton Roberts here, we've got other partners, um, part of our uh, partnering in our instructional coaching, but we've got a huge commitment to providing in classroom, uh, in school, instructional coaching to all of our teaching staff uh, over three years or so. And so uh, recently I read a book by Siegfried Engelman and he says some quite challenging things. Uh, but one of the challenging things is that every leader in a school and system has a responsibility to understand how to approach learning most effectively. He uses words like desperately efficient learning is needed. Because there's not a person here, I believe, who wouldn't agree that we're all committed to achieving equity through our efforts in education. And that means that everyone's got to learn <laughs> desperately efficiently, particularly those most disadvantaged, so that we can bring them up and give them equal opportunities with the highest achieving students. And I believe that's possible and we can make a huge difference through our efforts. But that was a very much a foundational uh, motivation. The teacher is the most important learner and you'll see as we thought about the, in the professional learning model, the support to teachers, how that came out. And uh, 
as we know, um, in education, and we, we just need to read, I guess, a week of newspapers to see how contested the role of schools, school education, education policy is in Australia. And really, uh, it was through podcasts like the Education Research Reading Room. It's a great podcast. If you're not subscribed, subscribe. There's others, but Ollie's is a really, really good one. It will lead you into all sorts of great discussion and reflection. But uh, for example, I started asking at the start of the journey, what is our definition of learning? What is our account of learning? Um, now, there's all sorts of definitions, some very, very imprecise. Some will lead to all sorts of um, design of schooling, design of classrooms, design of lessons. And I, I really believe that you can't go past, Kirshner's and others have used it, definition with a focus on learning, having an account of memory, saying that what is worth learning, what can be learnt if you can't remember it. Now, there's ways you could argue, of course, you can do things you can't remember how you learnt them, but really memory, I think, as educators, has to be foremost in our account of learning. And so we've put together, I guess, a rationale for ourselves, compiled informally, but it informs our program design, our reflections, our, our strategy of these uh, points. And foremost among them is that account of memory. Uh, and really, um, that's, by the way, that's closely associated with something, again, Ollie Lovell's well known for with his book, but cognitive load theory, which I think is one of the most profound theories that teachers need to understand its implications for how to approach classroom teaching and learning. So if you don't have an account of memory, I th my proposition is you can go wrong very quickly and I do commend, I thought Peps McCrea had this brilliant tweet thread where he summarised why memory is important to a conception of teaching and learning. I'd highly commend that to you. And uh, it starts with Geary though, that actually schooling is about learning things that you can't learn by yourself. So I believe that's an uncontroversial statement. Some people um, argue otherwise. But then teaching and learning is really about changing the memory of the student, changing the long-term memory, because we know that having access to information in your long-term memory is a power that you can't take away from somebody. They can think things that they couldn't think before because they've learned things by heart and committed them to long-term memory. And I believe that's the power of education. And really at the heart of Catalyst, we, we have a tagline that talks about teachers transforming lives through learning. We come from a Catholic education tradition, so we, we have concepts like vocation. They're, of course, not exclusive, but we've got a, a theological sense and a context for that. And so at its heart, Catalyst is really trying to engage our vocation as educators, our vocation as teachers. And I, I take it very strongly that Eng when Engelman says, can you really say you've taught if the student hasn't learnt? Can you be a teacher where the students aren't learning. Uh, in, in our archdiocese, I don't believe you can be a teacher if the students aren't learning, and that's about a change in long-term memory and achieving that. So, uh, and we are setting out to have a system where every teacher is not left to their own devices to determine what evidence we should pay attention to and how um, we go about applying that in our practice in the classroom. So there's still, within that, I believe, huge opportunity for professional application, professional thought, professional effort, but we should not let teachers um, be by themselves in trying to discern what is an amazingly complex array of evidence that we have access to. So we're trying to build a profession where we're accountable for the learning we provide and what the student uh, learns as a result. Now, I've been profoundly influenced also by E.D. Hirsch's Why Knowledge Matters. There's a chapter in his book, if you're not familiar with it, I really commend it. It tells the story of France where they pursued significant curriculum reform and showed that as a, he shows, if it's accurate, as a result of that curriculum reform, the inequity in the system 
went up dramatically, i.e. if you're from a disadvantaged background, you performed much lower as a result of this curriculum reform and achievement was less as a result. And what was the reform? It was devolve responsibility for the curriculum to the local level. So instead of having a high expectations, precise curriculum, they had more like Austra the Australian curriculum where you've got sort of general or vague standards devolved to the classroom or school or region to work out how to bring those to life. So I think it, that book in particular, the chapter on France and its experience, has a profound challenge to the Australian curriculum and what we might need to do in Australia in order to lift our reading comprehension performance in particular. And I'm very taken by the emerging movement in the US about not only the science of reading, but adding the science of reading comprehension and what we might need to do uh, as educators to bring that to life. And uh, one of the things uh, we did in preparing for this journey was we brought together teachers, principals, system leaders. Uh, I participated, um, people from across the system in a five-day experience we called the Evidence Forum, just reflecting on evidence, reading the best available evidence, talking to some nationwide leaders in reading, teaching, the research. We then visited schools as part of that. And one of the things that I was surprised about was that efficiency of learning was not a concern we had at all. That the million minutes that a student is with us from kindergarten to year 12, we don't feel a profound responsibility to use every one of those minutes really well for learning. Now, subsequent to that, I had some colleagues, an assistant principal, who's now a principal in our system, went back to their school and they then wrote down every time the students were not receiving instruction. And they worked out it was something like 40% of the time that the students were at school. It's thing, little things like, and I've heard great stories from Michael Roberts about turning his school uh, into a focus on instructional time, high quality instructional time. And we have many instances in our own system where schools in order to build community, start with an assembly every day. Things like that steal um, instruction, high quality instructional minutes from children. They reduce the million minutes. And what we know is that learning's cumulative. So if we take it away now, you miss an opportunity in the future uh, to learn based on the knowledge you'll get. So we do need to look at efficiency. And then of course, I believe that leads you very clearly to say, the most efficient way to learn something is to be told what it is you need to learn. Now, there's a lot of people who think there's a profound virtue in children discovering things for themselves. Uh, that might be true. But if our job is to provide the opportunity for young people to be the best people they can be, to fully flourish, we have, you know, we have a profound account of what we're striving to do for, holistically for the young people in our care, if we want them to know something, we're best to tell them. And we're best to give them opportunities for retrieval practice, spaced into leaving, all of these things. It's probably not a good idea to start with a question. Now I'm simplifying things radically, obviously. So that's, that's very much guiding. A question is what is the most effective way for these children to learn and what's the most effective way for us to teach? And explicit teaching, um, whether it's direct instruction, explicit teaching, there's lots of, a colleague of mine likes active teaching. All of these things are crucial to efficient um, learning, using those million minutes. And that, I believe that's, if we've got a professional obligation, prominent amongst them is to use every one of those million minutes that a student will be at school during their 13 years of compulsory schooling really well. And then we did, uh, I'll talk a little uh, bit in a moment about the goals that we've set as a system. Uh, but one of the things we reflected on, because a lot of systems around Australia are having a debate about whether um, mathematics is the problem, because they look at mathematics and their results aren't what they want, or is it reading? Well, they're further behind in mathematics, so we better start with mathematics. And of course, I've said to my colleagues, can you prove 
that the reason the students are doing poorly in maths isn't because they can't read the question. Now, so we've, <laughs> we've, we've got these big challenges as educators, these big trade-offs to navigate, uh, but we really believe that if we get reading right, if we move a student from learning to read to reading to learn as quickly as possible, now I'm simplifying it dramatically, but as quickly as possible, and then in theory we have rich, high rich knowledge, high expectation curriculum, that student will flourish and be on their uh, learning trajectory for their life and will have done a really good job. So we believe that reading is essential and some of the research is very clear uh, that through in-classroom instruction, you should reliably be able to progress students to, to good readers 90 to 95% of the time. So that means in a kindergarten classroom of 20, you're dealing with one or two students who need intervention. Now, in some instances in uh, recent history in our archdiocese, we had up to 50% of the cohort uh, in particular uh, grade levels, classes in an intervention program. So acknowledging that the teacher is the most important learner, we need to get the in-classroom instruction as high quality as possible and then have really good intervention programs for those who need it. We're not denying intervention is needed or extension might be needed, but the most important thing we can do is ensure our in-classroom instruction is excellent and caters for the 90 to 95% of students. Now, so some people can test those numbers, but I think that the um, evidence is very clear that we can reliably, with high quality instruction, get to 90 to 95% of students catered for through in-classroom instruction. And we've got amazing teachers able to do that. We're confident of that. And then, so this is probably a more outstanding challenge for us. Based on some of the work of E.D. Hirsch and his observations about knowledge-rich, precise, high expectations curriculum. And uh, Ben Jensen wrote an article in The Weekend's Australian. If you didn't see it, I'd encourage you to read it. It's, uh, it's a very high-level, challenging concept. But the opportunity to pursue the science of reading comprehension means that we need to give students uh, exposure to high-level vocabulary, complex material. We need to promote very high standard uh, non-fiction engagement uh, to build that vocabulary uh, and support that progress. Uh, so that, that's something we're working on. We're by no means arrived at the end of the journey, but we do need to lift our expectation and precision, not on everything that happens in the school day, but certainly on um, the core components where we should as professional educators expect that these children have an entitlement to really desperately efficient learning uh, that's, net, that's possible through that knowledge-rich content. So really, um, uh, I did note uh, in the panel discussion, which I was able to catch a little bit of, discussion about, and I'm a big fan of Aero, I'm a big fan of the work Glenn does, I'm a big fan of um, Jen Buckingham, partner with Knowledge Society, they've been uh, really important in our journey of Catalyst. Uh, there was just a, a pointing out that a question about why does a school improvement framework in one context not work in another? Why does it only work for one school? And so I, probably I'm very sceptical that frameworks are going to change much at all. <laughs> uh, it's the theory and the concepts that we understand, interrogate, discuss, debate about that's so important. And so my proposition is I'd rather start with a reading list than a framework. That would be what I'd say as a system leader. And I, I was talking with Eleanor recently and uh, she had a great line. I forget who we attribute it to, but um, one of the most practical things is a great theory. <laughs> and so we, we had to spend, and we're still doing this um, in our system with our teachers, with our principals, really delving deep into our understanding of the theory. Because we've come from a system, come as a system from a, a dominant paradigm of inquiry learning, where there was very little precision about what inquiry meant. Now, everyone was working incredibly hard, but we were not seeing 
um, much improvement, no consistent improvement, and in fact on comparative measures to other school systems, we weren't able to add value in numeracy or literacy to the extent we wanted to. There was no reflection on anyone's work ethic, anyone's dedication, but we were not meeting the expectations of our parents and students. In fact, as director, I, I do many school visits, talk with parents, and one parent said to me very clearly, you have an amazing school community here. It's just a real pity about the learning. And that's a wake up call for all of us um, if we're serious about education. So this is the, just a sample. This is probably 90% of the things that I've been influenced by. There's another book I'll talk about in a second. Um, I do really commend, and uh, the, the other things in my professional life are certainly Edge of Twitter how you can get into very high quality resources with people like Pam Snow, but also the amazing proliferation of uh, great quality uh, podcasts has really changed our opportunity. And the challenge for us as a system was to bring this into conversation in schools. And so we did that very successfully, I think, through making eight very high quality video units about the core things of science of reading, science of learning, about the length of time that was appropriate to unpack in a staff meeting. So instead, as we all dread, turning up to a meeting where the duties were handed out and we debated all sorts of other things, we're now attempting to use as much of that meeting time focused on learning as possible. Um, and these were all very influential in that. And I, I do what really want to commend Why Knowledge Matters. I think it's one of the most profound uh, books on education. You don't need to read it cover to cover. The chapters stand alone by themselves. I'd really, really commend it. We've had E.D. Hirsch participate in our professional learning. He's better to read than to hear speak. No, he's, yeah, and Ollie had him on the podcast. I think he's still got very many profound things to say. I think the best podcast he's done is with Greg Ashman, with respect. <laughs> um, and there's one in, he, I think he did a First Things podcast uh, talking about the role of knowledge. And so I think he's got some really profound things for, for Western societies to reflect on. Uh, so I really highly commend you that. And it, it is the core challenge that defines what Ben Jensen's talking about, what others are talking about of knowledge rich. Because in the absence of a commitment to teaching our students knowledge, we're not sure what they're going to be able to do with their lives, to be honest. If they've just got skills, if they have no knowledge, I think it's a profound challenge. And then this is a, a recent one I, I read, and I'm sure that very, very few people have read this. And I'm sure that very, very few people will ever pick it up because it's provocatively titled, it's written by Siegfried Engelman. He's, you know, got all sorts of associations with him. It is an amazing book. I don't think every chapter is of equal quality. There's a couple of chapters in there that are really, really profound. One of them says, we all have a responsibility in systems to take responsibility for the learning. It is not just the teacher's role. It's not just the principal's role. It's everyone. And no one should be left on their own in that. The other, um, one of the other very provocative things he says is that if we were serious about our profession as educators, we would be able to confidently say, I am going to take this action, this will be the observable result. And in theory, if we're that expert, we'd be able to say that in advance of our action. Now, all too, and it was referred to in passing in the panel, that statement about we, we're not progressing on reading to the extent we'd like to in Australia. We're not. So obviously the admonition to everyone in schools is get better at reading. Now, <laughs> you just, you don't have to be sort of very informed to know that is not an actionable statement. And given 100 teachers, there'll be probably 200 different ways that you'll respond to that. And the same thing goes for get better at numeracy, get better at reading. So my contention is that we don't need to focus as much on data. The most important data that we need is to know whether the student learned what we taught. So my controversial statement is the whiteboard's going to be more important than the dashboard and the most important student assessment will be a check for understanding. 
because the most important thing as a teacher is to know, did the student learn just what I intended to teach? And I don't think um, we don't need uh, a huge superstructure to help us answer that question. We, NAPLAN's valuable, will be a useful policy instrument, will provide great insights, but we have to focus always on distilling something to an actionable statement, either for teachers, for schools, or for systems. And that's very rare in a lot of the data commentary. But I commend that book to you, and I'd love to have a chat with anyone who does read it. Uh, I'm happy to book a time for that. I, it really is a great book. Um, you won't, I don't think you'll hear uh, what he's saying in very many other places. Um, and I, I don't think it's all true or all accurate, but it's uh, certainly very provocative. And this is part of, I guess, our challenge as a system. We're only 56 schools. We've got amazing teachers, amazing school leaders, but we, and it was partly driven by COVID and the reality of um, video conferencing became a thing, Zoom became a thing. All of a sudden, there wasn't a barrier um, with other countries. We were able to bring some of these people from the UK, the US, into discussion with our colleagues in a very profound way. So all of these people have been hugely important in developing our conceptual understanding, our theory of learning, our theory of teaching, uh, which are key to, and benefiting from colleagues, by the way, in Western Australia, that uh, explicit instruction investment that has happened. I think that's a, you know, a shorthand way of referring to it, but uh, such an important movement. So we've tapped into, we think, some of the best people, not all the best people, but absolutely many of the best people around Australia and internationally. So briefly what we've done. Now we really just, it's important to understand what we're trying to do here is just simplify things so that we, we have a shared sense, a shared understanding, a shared sense of meaning and purpose. That we, we really thought long and hard that there's a curriculum strand, a pedagogy strand, an assessment strand. Now, of course, they're all happening in the classroom. So it's a danger to see them as distinct, but we thought you can usefully think about what is taught, how it's taught, and how we know the students have learned. And so my reflection would be, you can move through pedagogical improvement and assessment change much faster than you can pursue curriculum change. That's a long process. So we have pursued pedagogical change. You'll talk, hear about Rosenshine's principles in forming our high impact teaching practice. If you talk to colleagues who are here, we're pursuing assessment change. We've got Dibbles, the phonic screening check. We, we want the best assessment to tell the teachers what students have learnt. We want it to be the most efficient possible. We don't want it to take long. We don't want it to be highly subjective. We want it to be highly objective, accurate, reliable, and give really good information in as concise a time as possible. So we're doing a lot of thinking. We're not nowhere near where we want to be, but we're doing a lot of thinking about what assessments are expected for everyone so that we know what the students have learnt. And then, of course, curriculum. That's, I think it's ahead of us. We've started with some really important partnerships, people like OCA, with others trying to develop really high quality, knowledge rich units that can be a starting point for teachers at least. Uh, and I think there's great potential um, there in time because we know recently the Grattan Institute found from a survey of 10,000 teachers or what, something of that magnitude that teachers estimate, something like 65% of teachers estimate that they could save three hours a week if they had access to high quality instructional materials. Now the high quality instructional materials have to be coherent. So they have to be, um, they have to be able to answer the whole unit level or whole subject, not be uh, left to the teacher or the school to weave them together, stitch them together somehow. So that's, that's ahead of us, but we've started in part on that journey. And then, uh, so I just want to talk about the bold goals briefly. So as I said, we, we had a recognition that we thought if students can read, they'll be well set up. Now I think that's really hard to argue against. So the way we've expressed it is that every student is a competent reader. Now one of the problems some colleagues here will know is that 
That's a primary statement, not a secondary statement, apparently. But we know that secondary students aren't reading as well, but the needs are very, as well as we'd like, but the needs are very different. So we've, we've had to do some work to put that, what it means in a secondary context. But we do believe, and so also, um, because of the success of people like Jennifer Buckingham and others in um, getting people to realise if we don't have students improve their phonics knowledge as tested by the phonics screening check, there's, a, there's some people have a propensity to say, oh, it's all about phonics. And we know it's absolutely not all about phonics. So when we think about a competent reader, we're thinking about a year 12 student reading Paradise Lost by Milton. We're thinking about them reading um, other great uh, pieces of literature, including, in our case, the Bible and learning what they can learn from it. So we're not thinking about our job being done with a phonics screening check. We're not thinking about them reaching level 25 on a leveled reader. We're thinking about them being able to pick up some of the most complex literature and understand what it means for them. That's our aspiration for a competent reader in our system, what the student leaves with in terms of their comprehension capability when at year 12. Now that's incredibly ambitious and we're still um, working on that. The other uh, goal we set ourselves is high impact teaching practice visible in every classroom. Now uh, we had a problem there, I just wanna share that immediately we started talking about that. Some uh, well-meaning colleagues Googled high impact teaching practice and found there's a high impact teaching strategies document from Victoria. And they thought, we'll just get on with doing this now, I, my, my caution to anybody, uh, I think high impact teaching practice needs to be defined by what it's not as much as what it is. And so I do not believe differentiation should immediately, absent a very clear definition of what it is, should immediately be included in the definition of high impact teaching practice. I think that should be discussed and reflected on because I think we can go down a path where people believe that every student deserves a totally individualised learning plan and I don't think that's sustainable, I don't think it's necessary, I don't think it's the most effective use of teaching time. I think we can achieve great outcomes through in-class instruction for 90 to 95 per cent of the students. So I, I don't think differentiation is where I'd start. So we were very careful, if you read our material, it's all publicly available. High impact teaching practice is very meticulously defined with reference to Rosenstein's principles of instruction. It's not everything you'd imagine, um, which other systems have absolutely included in their definition of uh, high impact instruction. So that I believe that's really important for us because we do need to avoid low impact strategies, low value strategies, low efficiency strategies. And then you can see uh, there is this huge commitment to the science of learning and the science of reading. I won't talk more about that. You've, you've very much delved into that. We're in a room, hopefully, of true believers and people who are knowledgeable in this area, so I won't go into that. But I do want to reflect on the professional learning model, school resources and system enablers. So part of the agenda in Catalyst is that we want to be a system and reflect on what that means. That means that there's benefits to being part of a system, that you're not an isolated teacher, you're not an isolated school, that there's a professional collegiality that extends beyond the walls of your classroom, beyond the walls of your school. And then uh, it is clear we've got a history in our own system and I've worked in other systems where professional learning, everyone knows it, consists of a day out of the classroom, a day out of the school. So our commitment, first commitment was the thing that matters is what goes on in the classroom. Our professional learning now is targeted, although we do take uh, teachers out of the school, we take them out and they sit with other teachers and we focus on what's going to happen in the classroom. So just two weeks ago, for example, 60 colleagues met in a school during the school holidays and we brought in students because we wanted to actually practice teaching and then colleagues sat around the room and critiqued colleagues teaching because the thing that we're trying to improve is teaching not abstract notions of teaching so of course so there is a question about 
in our professional learning, there's a question about what the theory that our teachers need to know. So we do focus on that. That's the reading list. That's the professional resources. Then there's a question about what is high quality efficient practice? And we have people like Tony Hatton Roberts, Michael Roberts, Lorraine Hammond, um, uh, Ingrid Seely and her colleagues demonstrate to us through acquired through years of experience, this is high quality efficient practice. Then everybody gets a chance to do that for themselves. And then there's coaching and feedback to those teachers based on what they've seen and are they able to do it. And now, what, I, what I'm describing might sound like we're taking away teacher professional autonomy, we're taking away um, undermining the independence of the teacher. The encouragement for me is that the teachers involved tell me their vocation has been enriched because their students are learning. In some instances, students who couldn't read at grade two are now reading because of their commitment to the teacher practice that we've accessed uh, through this program. So there's no, I think there's no more profound reflection than comes from parents, from students themselves, and that feedback to the teachers. And really there's no greater um, emphasis of any program than the teachers saying, through this practice, students are now learning more. And I think we're achieving that. So we're not, it's not perfect, it's far from perfect. Uh, there's a long way to go. So that, that, that's, I think, the essence of our program. I could say a lot more. So just briefly, we've engaged all principals. We've had more than 700 teachers trained in some of our high-impact teaching practices. We are still, I confirmed with Ian, the largest system implementation of Initialit in Australia. Um, there's some systems who could claim that if they acknowledge that their schools were doing it, but we'll wait for that. Um, so we have a commitment to high quality literacy instruction. There's no single program that'll solve that, but there are programs that can be a fantastic starting point. Uh, so, and really the challenge remains ahead of us. I won't go in, I've talked a lot about that, I think. I just want to reflect for one minute, Rosenshine's principles of instruction, by no means perfect, but very much uh, reflective of things like cognitive load theory, the instructional guidance that comes from deep reflection on what cognitive load theory entails uh, for instruction. So I'd highly commend that. That's been highly influential in determining what's in and what's out of high impact teaching practice. And really, so there's no magic answer as we know, but we know that if these sort of attributes of high impact teaching practice are evident, we're going to be successful in advancing student learning. Um, and so have we, have we got definitive figures? Now, so I've, I've just listed some things up there, some cheeky saying that Aero's interested in it um, from Jenny Donovan. So I, I just wanna, the, uh, and I'm still operating, I acknowledge at the anecdotal level, I visited one of our schools, it's a country school, it's about an hour and a half from Canberra, they have data now tracked on some standardised tests that show that within two years of adopting these practices and some of the programs, this particular school is working with Lorraine Hammond, there are other schools that are similar, 80% of their cohort in year five is now performing above the 20th percentile two years ago. So that, I, I'm being a bit shorthand in the description, it'd be better if I had a graph, but 80% of the students are above the performance of the 20th percentile two years ago. So literally lifting the performance by grade levels in maths um, and spelling in particular. So we've got every reason to believe what we're doing is successful if we stick at it, if we have high fidelity. And so there's much that could be said and really just to finish on this, this is my highest level synthesis that we're going from all sorts of ideology to science. We're respecting that actually, we have fantastic teachers who are absolutely concerned with the learning of students. So when we know better, we do better and we're seeing that in classrooms across the archdiocese. We are really thinking hard about what it means to be a professional teacher, what that means in terms of supports, 
access to curriculum resources. We believe that in time, the more precise we can be about curriculum, pedagogy and assessment expectations, the better we'll be, the better support we'll provide. Now, in a controversial statement, I could talk for half an hour about this, but we believe that learning is a great way to improve confidence, well-being, and so we've got to ask ourselves, can we achieve this always and everywhere through improved learning? And we think learning, being successful at learning, is a great way for, mo for many students to improve all sorts of other things in their lives. You do need, I'd really caution other systems, at every step along the way, there are lethal mutations waiting to undermine the fidelity of practice that we're striving for that'll improve student learning. And uh, just as I talked about earlier, we do have a deep aspiration to really have a clear link between um, cause and effect. And if we're true professionals, we should be able to achieve that. So I just want to um, say, if anyone's uh, looking for a tree change, we've got great schools on the coast in New South Wales. But if you're not looking to uh, change jobs, you'd be very welcome to visit. Um, we'd love to collaborate with you to learn um, from you and your experience. Uh, we haven't got everything right. And I'd really encourage you to seek out colleagues who work in Canberra Goulburn now, if you're interested in learning more, because we do have so much to learn from other, I know not necessarily whole systems, but we've learned so much from individual schools, from um, individual teachers and leaders. And being here today is obviously a sign of your great commitment um, to the learning of students and the future equity and outcomes of education in Australia. So thanks for the opportunity to speak with you today and I wish you every success.